to try to react to a few things that people have said before. Um, so uh, the the talk. Let me. I'm going to share my screen because I just have some pictures and I have to. Uh, let's see. Where is it? There it is. Um, so if you can pardon the um, uh, the the PDF version of this. Uh, some of this uh, draws on a study that Peter Freeman and, uh, and Bill Asprey and I did over uh, the last three or four years that led to this book. Uh, I might also point out that there are thousands of, so Larry talked about how he's a pack rat and he never throws anything away and neither do I and neither did Peter Freeman. So we were able to donate three or 4,000 paper and electronic documents to the Babbage Institute but the Babbage Institute is still looking to find the funds to actually make those available to historians and researchers. Uh, the other thing, uh, Larry also shared with me every copy of the CSNet News, which I, I, I appreciated for the use of the book and I also appreciated for the use today. Um, so um, let me give you a little background at NSF. So I, I have done three tours of duty at NSF. I was there in uh, the late 70s and I was there uh, from early 80s through the mid 80s and I was there again from 2000 to 2003. Um, so I mean I, I arrived at a time of transition within NSF uh, when computer science uh, was becoming a, a program of its own uh, uh, divorced from its historical uh, connection to facilities programs. But through the 60s and 70s, most of the NSF uh, computing programs were, uh, uh, research programs were kind of a side show to the, uh, the provision of general scientific computing facilities uh, to universities. Uh, there was a, some primitive and initial networking activities that went on uh, during those times. Uh, so Okwa mentioned Plato and Logo and Lego. Those are things that NSF supported uh, the development and uh, in fact I used to have a Play-Doh terminal sitting in my office at NSF when I was there. Um, but during that period of time NSF management was skeptical about the computers, computing research community as a whole uh, and whether it had become organized enough and they were really adverse to supporting networking on the scale and uh, the unproven value at least from their perspective of of something like the ARPANET. NSF doesn't like to run facilities for a very long time, uh, is the official line, although they have tended to run some facilities for a very long time. Um, so there was not much support for looking at networking. Uh, and let me go to the next slide here just for a second. Um, these are a couple of people I think were really important. Um, John Pasta and Kent Curtis early in the, uh, the existence of uh, computer science at NSF and then Eric Block and Gordon Bell later and I'll come back to Eric and, and, and Gordon. Um, things changed uh, in the late 70s uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, um, Larry, uh, Dick Lipton, Rich DeMillo, Ed Robertson had proposed the theory net which, would, which was really a uh, messaging service um, uh, that theory researchers could use to collaborate. It was funded by Rick Weingarten at, at NSF, uh, and Rick got um, Star Roxanne Hiltz, a sociologist, to at least show that it was uh, effective in supporting scientific collaboration. Uh, the other thing that happened around those times uh, was that uh, computer scientists were beginning to issue reports uh, including the Feldman Report, the Snowbird Report, citing the loss of experimental computing talent to industry because universities that weren't among the very few DARPA-funded schools really lacked the facilities uh, to do experimental research and they lacked a network for collaboration. Um, the leadership uh, of the uh, NSF Advisory Committee uh, then urged John Pasta and Kit Curtis to tax the computing research budget to develop this coordinated experimental research program. And that program included CSNet. Uh, and Kent uh, had recruited me back to NSF to run the CER program. 
uh, and he recruited uh, Bill Kern to uh, be the manager of CSNet. Larry's already talked about uh, the series of meetings he was involved with and, and, uh, and Vince's uh, great help with uh, uh, organizing what became proposals that were eventually successful in NSF. And uh, a lot of these things change the, uh, the general attitude of, uh, of NSF management. So uh, we had uh, been looking and Ken had been, Ken had been holding uh, out to try to develop some form of networking for the entire science community, but at least for the computer science community since the early 70s. And, uh, and of course, he, he, he was running up against a, a lot of internal pushback for that. But in 1980, after we got the proposal from Larry and, and his colleagues uh, for CSNet, um, uh, Pasta and Curtis and Bill Kern and I, uh, with some allies in the, on the National Science Board, particularly Peter Lax and Saunders McLean, and from the computer science community who sort of lobbied their representatives on the National Science Board, uh, we managed to get CSNet approved for, as Larry pointed out, what is now $14 million of funding in, in current dollars. Um, but, but the board would only do so because there was criticism of the proposals not having a strong management plan. And so the idea was to have Bill Kern manage CSNet with two years for two years with contracts to Wisconsin and with Larry, uh, to Delaware with Dave, with, to Purdue with Peter Denning, to Rand Corporation with Tern, Tony Hearn, and to BBN, and Laura will talk about the CIC's role, which I think was critical. And CSNet, as you know, was composed of, uh, of, uh, of three uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Bill Kern's drawing of CSNet, or maybe it was one, one of the other people. Um, I don't know whether people can see this too well, but the idea was that we were uh, gonna build a network that had three components to it, PhoneNet, which has already been talked about, ARPANET, and thanks to Bob Kahn and, and Ben Cerf, we were able to connect ARPANET and CSNet uh, after agreeing that we would run TCP IP and we were, also connecting uh, uh, public networks, which didn't come along immediately, it came along later. And actually, I think it was really promoted during a period of time when industry uh, uh, labs joined CSNet. So after two years, the UCAR, which is the parent uh, organization for the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, assumed the management of CSNet. And then, um, the CSNet, uh, Denning is missing from this picture, but uh, there's Dick Edmondson and Dave Farber and um, I'm drawing blank, Lynn Romney and uh, Larry and me and, and Tony Hearn were the CSNet uh, executive committee, which eventually grew to about 30 people. The, the CIC, the initial four people on the CIC were Laura and Dan Long and Beth Johnson and Dick Edmondson. Um, I, uh, I know that uh, Dave had mentioned that he brought down two uh, computers. This is, the, this is the computer he brought down to be the host at NSF. It's a uh, Onyx 5000. <clears throat> and we had two of them and about a dozen uh, IBM PCs and an ethernet connection. But I'll also comment that we were not completely absent of access to the internet in those days because we uh, all had accounts on uh, on ARPA's uh, ISI-based servers, and uh, and uh, sooner or later, actually, Connie McClendon moved over from DARPA to run the IT program at, at NSF, and uh, moved us from running HP COBOL machines to to uh, becoming a full-fledged uh, server on the uh, internet later on the NSF net. Um, I'll tell you, CSNet uh, sites increased. Uh, so did, as Dave already mentioned, the demand by young researchers. Uh, when I would go around looking at putting large facility projects into universities, I got a lot of skepticism about CSNet. They said, why do we want to talk to anybody? Um, <clears throat> but as, as they began to attract a lot of 
young new researchers in experimental computer science. They uh, wanted to talk to their colleagues at other campuses and they wanted to talk to colleagues in the uh, ARPA world. Um, they've already mentioned the fact that industry became quite interested and, uh, and uh, our other colleagues here have talked about how international networks wanted to connect. So due to the efforts of Larry and Dave and other people in CSNet, along with NSF sort of continuing interest in international scientific collaboration, CS began to make, CSNet began to make connections to networks around the world beginning in the early to mid eighties. And that's what we're celebrating today. <coughs> Excuse me, NSF um, uh, support for CS for computer science and networking really improved when I go back to that original picture when, um, oops, sorry. When Eric Block uh, came in, he, Eric, as you know, was a senior vice president at IBM, um, the first non-academic to become NSF director. <laughs> and Eric hired Gordon Bell from digital equipment of uh, digital equipment fame to, to lead the NSF's computing directorate. And Gordon expanded the networking recommendations that were in the Curtis Bardom uh, supercomputers report uh, to create NSFNet. Um, and the success of CSNet and its international breadth really led in, to and influenced NSFNet. As NSFNet, as Larry already mentioned, overtook CSNet, its services were discontinued in 1991. Gordon and at first Dennis Jennings and later Steve Wolf really moved NSFNet towards uh, becoming today's internet. And I, I have to mention that um, after Larry's hard work traveling the world, connecting everyone to, to NSFNet and CSNet, uh, Steve Goldstein did a lot of work um, expanding those efforts. So Laura, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I have some slides too, and I'm going to oh, see if I can you. make work. Uh, and so I'm going to share my screen and I am going to go here. No. If not, I don't have you to put up the slice. Can you put them up? Yeah, that'd be great. I can't tell you how many times we practice this with two computers in the room and where are they? Okay. Um, so the CSNet CIC was part of the plan from the beginning and I wasn't around when the beginning happened. So I don't know how it ended up at BBN. I do know that BBN was a prominent site on the ARPANET and also had very strong ties to the academic community, um, particularly to places like MIT and Harvard, which were right down the street, essentially. So we, um, and I joined in early 1983. So the CIC had been established for maybe a year. Um, and I think that if you'll move to the next slide, Sherry, <laughs> this is the internet, <laughs> the CSNet in 1982. And um, you'll notice that there aren't a lot of sites on the map yet, and that the names of the um, host computers are pretty simple because there was no domain name system in 1982. And um, I remember vividly too, because I was responsible for the CSNet newsletter that when we needed a map, we went down to the art department at BBN and they created a map for us. So um, this is one that came out of, I believe one of Larry's uh, documents in, in his trove, which he dug out for me. Next slide, please, Jerry. So, what did the network look like? Well, in 1982, there were about 66 sites, none of which were international. Um, the network was well connected to the ARPANET through our email bridges and some 
I don't think we had at that point any X25. So X25 was the ISO packet switching protocol. And we, uh, Doug Comer, who was at Purdue University, was developing a way to run X25 over a commercial uh, packet switching network in the United States. So we had TCP IP, um, but it was, uh, not a large network and it was not an international network by any means. Fast forward to November of 1988 and there are about 187 sites on the network. Um, thanks, Bent, that's helpful. Um, uh, and 13 countries. So, and the countries, this, these were essentially gateways into research networks um, in countries overseas. It's interesting to me that among those um, international sites were Sony in Tokyo, ICOT in Tokyo, uh, the Electrotechnical Lab also in Tokyo. I believe NTT was a member. Um, so Vince telling us, uh, I'm not gonna read that now, but um, I, in the list of the network uh, sites that we have from 1982, there aren't any that are international. So the point being here is that this was a very gradual process. Um, as you've heard um, from our colleagues in Asia, there was tremendous demand um, to be connected to the um, computer, computer science research community in the United States, but also as I'm sure you can tell from the presentations you've already heard, there was a global push for more ability to connect with each other, exchange information, um, collaborate on research and this kind of thing. Uh, I think we also have to remember that uh, facilities were very expensive then, far more expensive uh, in many ways than they are now. For example, the computers that we had, um, that we were running the network uh, on at BBN, I remember we had a VAC 750 that I believe cost a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and those were $1982. dollars um, so it was, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about these numbers in just a minute. So it was a very um, resource intensive undertaking to do these projects and computing power was expensive and facilities, um, uh, phone circuits and that sort of thing also were tremendously expensive. This is what I remember about the cost structure, which it doesn't align completely with what some of the other memories, but since I was out there selling it to people, I think, I think my memory is pretty reliable. So when I joined the, C, uh, the CIC, I started as the user liaison. And I think one reason that the CIC was effective is that we were very, we were very customer focused and we really thought of the, the sites on the network as our customers and that we were there to serve them. And everybody on the staff, in fact, this was something that we looked for when we were hiring people, had a service orientation. So um, from Dick Edmiston who ran the project to me and Dan Long and um, Beth, whom you saw in a picture a moment ago. Um, and as we added people, it is the same kind of thing that um, we, I think we're very conscious that we were part of a community. It was a young community. It was a very vital community. Um, we all had the sense, and I, I certainly got this from Larry and um, not all of the members of the executive committee, but, but a lot of them, that this was very exciting, that what we were doing and what we were building was going to make a difference. So this is what the, the fee structure looked like. Um, large corporations paid $30,000 a year um, 
I believe they could have up to two connections to the network um, for $30,000. That would be $78,000 in today's dollars. Um, large universities, um, so the University of Wisconsin would be a large university and Beloit College also in Wisconsin would be a small university. Um, <clears throat> paid these annual dues of $5,000 or $2,500. Um, one of the functions of the CIC was to send out the bills. Um, we also had, and I'm not sure that anybody anticipated this at the time, but we had a lot of revenue <laughs> from dial-up charges. Um, we charged a per minute fee uh, for basically time on the relays. Now the relays were these computers that were at Delaware and ran and what they were doing was exchanging uh, email messages, um, doing handoff to whatever the destination was ultimately. Uh, and I remember that they were 9,600 baud connections, at least at the beginning. I don't know if that changed over time. Um, but there were a lot of minutes that you could roll up exchanging email and occasionally a file with another um, user on the network. So this was our cash cow. And I, we must have been succeeding because I don't I went to most of the management committee meetings and I don't remember a whole lot of tension about money. Uh, perhaps in the chat, we'll find out something different uh, or in the Q and A. Um, well, we'll, we can talk about that uh, momentarily. Um, can you move to the last slide? I just wanted to share some further thoughts with you about what it was like to um, be running this project in those early days. Um, and it was certainly exciting that there was so much interest and demand from other countries. So that was, um, that was a tremendous part of what we were doing. Um, and as it says on this slide, the demand was very strong, but the barriers were huge because uh, of the expense that was associated with um, both the equipment and the difficulty of using, of finding um, uh, the transoceanic circuits that you typically needed to make all this happen. Um, I'll, I'll hop back to the beginning of this slide and say that um, TCPIP and Unix were not obvious winners at the outset. In the, um, in the 80s here, most uh, computer vendors, DEC and Prime and, and um, IBM had their own proprietary network protocols. Um, they thought that theirs were going to be the ones that everybody used. There was a, some amount of effort put into building ways for one manufacturer's computer to share information with another manufacturer's computer. But um, I feel like, and if, um, if others who have maybe a longer perspective on this would care to comment, I feel like they were not the obvious winners at the beginning of all this. Um, and, but they were very good choices in the long run because I think open systems and, um, the way they evolved and the fact that they were not um, hugely expensive and particularly that they weren't tied to a, uh, one vendor. Those were all very important things. Um, <clears throat> a day that I will never forget is the 2nd of November, 1988, um, when the internet worm happened and uh, it, happened kind of late in the day um, uh, on <clears throat> Cambridge, Massachusetts time, which is where we were. And nobody really knew what it meant, but we knew that we had a lot of computers that were connected to this network. And we felt very responsible for 
protecting them. And we had to make a decision very quickly about what to do. And, um, and so we took the network down. And I remember that we did not, we needed to get in touch with our Asian um, customers and let them know what was going on. And I remember sending faxes to places like uh, NTT to explain uh, what we what what was happening and why we had taken the steps that we did. And I think that was that was a very interesting moment in the history of uh, what was was happening in networking because the all the benefits and the excitement that were associated with growing the the universe of people and institutions that could communicate um, was somewhat suddenly revealed to have a, um, a, a dark side, if you will. Um, Robert Morris, by the way, is now a, he was the author of The Internet Worm. He's a tenured professor at MIT. Um, <clears throat> and I've, I wanted to say also that because of the, um, the US government involvement, um, which as you can tell, I think from listening to the history was critical and, and extremely beneficial. Um, it also meant that um, connecting non-US institutions to the network required a policy review, often on a country by country basis, often in multiple agencies. Um, and I think that uh, that Kilnam perhaps mentioned some of the sharing that ultimately went on of facilities in the Pacific. Um, and that would be another example where um, there were undersea cables to Hawaii that it would be great, you know, for somebody to be able to use who wasn't part of NASA or whichever agency had the cables to Hawaii. Um, so it took, I think, a lot of uh, dedication and um, some of the attitude that Jun brought to the program. <laughs> um, and yet we did it. Um, so I feel like those years were really formative in terms of what you could uh, do with computer networks and how you could build a community. Um, if you had the infrastructure to support it. One of the things that I also felt very much because I was responsible for going out and sort of selling the network and getting new customers. So I was very aware of demand and where demand was. And I will say that there were many, once other departments in the university started to hear, get wind of, what was going on in computer science and how easy it was to share information. There was pressure from humanities and um, the sciences and other parts of the university to be able to use the facilities. And um, ultimately I was part of the evolution of this, the regional networks, which NSF was already supporting um, probably as early as 1986. It's hard for me to remember specifically. That's about right. Um, that they were going to connect um, rather than you know this sort of storm forward host star network topology, they were gonna have regional networks that managed um, connections and traffic within a region that would then in turn connect to the US, um, the, Nash, the NSF net. Um, and one of my, my favorite things, and I, I think this speaks to the creativity of the people at NSF that, um, that Rick was talking about, that they're gonna build this NSF net backbone and, um, and it's gonna be tremendously fast. I think 56 kilobits per second. <laughs> And they're going to <clears throat> entice companies to get in the game and 
basically pay for a lot of the facilities, which is ultimately what happened. Um, so I think the stage was set um, by CSNet and by the kind of um, both guts and enthusiasm that went into making CSNet a success. I think the stage was set for some of the very important developments that then ultimately created a commercial internet. So that's what I had to say. Um, I so Laura, did you see an increased demand um, by individual institutions as more, I mean, because it was pretty expensive. So a lot of institutions ran phone net once a day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. did you, so did you see people starting to run it once an hour or? Uh, I don't remember. Um, and I called my friend Dan Long, who uh, he's a vice president at Akamai now. I've right. Right. <laughs> nice. Um, but he didn't remember that kind of thing either. So there may be somebody around. I, I think Mike O'Brien, who has, I believe, retired, but he's a, I'm still in touch with him. And he's the kind of person who would remember that. I, I want to thank everybody for the program up to this date and we've done a good job and i think what's important here is not only celebrating the 35th but leaving a trail for future generations because one thing that happens in history if you're not very careful is that uh it gets distorted as time goes on so having these records of from people who were involved in the early days recorded and, and it will show up on archives all over the place, I think is very, very important. Uh, if I could throw in one sort of funny little comment and then I'll introduce John. Uh, uh, the, the internet worm, Bob Morris's worm, Junior's worm, uh, always intrigued me because I first met Bob Morris Jr when his father, Bob Morris, at Bell Laboratories brought in his new baby, which was Bob Morris <laughs> Jr. And I held him. Uh, and then when Bob back, Morris Jr. actually uh, un unwittingly, as far as I can tell, let loose the worm, uh, Bob Morris was chief scientist at NSA. So it was, uh, there were, whole sorts of interesting things. I want to thank the panelists and I'm going to introduce Jun in a moment. Uh, the center is going to try to uh, continue doing programs like this where appropriate uh, to uh, leave a, an echo in the, for the past, future. Uh, I asked Jun to talk about sort of where Asia is going in internet, uh, in network developments. And so, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, John. 